So as I was saying, today we have a really, really fun and exciting uh, talk to uh, about autonomous racing, right? I mean, it's going to be a lot of fun. And um, this talk is also a, a team talk, right? So I want to also introduce my team as, they, uh, as we talk about different topics that we will learn through. But first, let's start from um, the beginning where we, we essentially, um, our research in our lab focuses at this intersection of working on life critical systems, safety critical systems. And that's where we have to build you know, mathematical models to formally prove that these systems you know, will, will be safe no matter what the circumstances are. And that's a big challenge because the environments that we work in with these systems are very varied. They are unexpected. There's a lot of uncertainty. We work a lot on control systems where there is perception, planning, and an action loop. And uh, so these are systems such as uh, uh, autonomous vehicles, medical devices that are implanted in your body, energy systems. And we build tools that have a lot of machine learning under the hood. But no matter what domain we work in, we have the same research question that we always ask is, how do we provide safety and performance guarantees for these closed loop systems? So, so obviously today we're gonna to talk about, you know, autonomous vehicles and autonomous vehicles at the extreme. And so this talk is divided into a couple of themes that are centered around, you know, why we do our research in racing and what can we get out of that? And how does that expose very interesting and Far, further reaching research questions. So the first theme is, you know, as we have multiple agents, how, how do we generate the most competitive set of agents who can then dynamically balance safety and assertiveness? You don't want to crash in a race, but you still want to win. So how do you sort of negotiate that balance all the time in, in different situations? A second theme then is, to say, okay, fine, you want to, if you want to race, you got to have the best car. You got to optimize the, the mechanical aspect of it, the perception, the planning, the control aspect of it. How do you do this in a more automatic manner? How do you automatically tune your vehicle to perform the best in a given environment? And then in a new environment, how do you do this uh, all over again and automate that process? The third theme is that, Obviously, this is very high stakes kind of game, right? This is not just playing Tetris or Pong or some kind of discrete kind of two player game. Oh, yeah, we are playing a multiplayer game. And you can see now uh, companies are sponsoring autonomous racing competitions for real. These are multi million dollar race cars, and you don't want to crash them. But unfortunately, even in the simulation test runs before these, 12 out of 16 of the agents crashed on, on, you know, just in a few seconds after the start. So how do we stress test the, the planning and control algorithms of these very interactive and adversarial agents? So how do we search for where crashes happen, why they happen, and then do that in a very efficient manner? So we're really building a search engine for crashes. And then we want to sort of say, okay, fine, as we design new systems, not just race cars, but drones, uh, but other kind of, you know, uh, autonomous systems, how do we design them? We don't want to start from just a library of components every time and then put that together manually and go through 10 stages of like a model-based design system. So we want to sort of see, okay, well, look, we are say like, if you're a big company, like say, you know, Boeing, you have many past designs. How can you mine your past designs to build new designs for new requirements? So how can you use some kind of learning-based methods as part of your model-based design pipeline to basically fill in the blanks? So if you have a partially completed design, say 50% completed design, how can you basically get that to an 80% completed design with an 80% chance of success for new requirements? And then the most over, important theme is the, our overall theme is how can you, you know, as part of the 
set of students that are part of our lab over the years, and this goes on to 2020, 21, just the slide's not that big, is, but all of these students have gone into a career you know, of their choice. And they're really enjoying it over there, as far as I know, especially that guy who's become a YouTube star. Uh, I, don't, I don't take any credit for his training, but he's a smart guy anyway. So he has over 8 million subscribers, actually. Um, so, so the question is, you know, how do you get involved and what are opportunities for you to get involved in this, right? So, uh, so let's start with the theme one, right? So how do we generate the most competitive agents who dynamically balance safety and assertiveness? Right, so and this is based on a paper written by uh, Billy Hongri Zeng, uh, my former student Matthew O'Kelly, and his collaborators in Stanford, Aman Sinha. And so Matt and Aman, after graduation, had a startup company on actually doing, you know, safety uh, safety checks or explorations for autonomous vehicles, and that got acquired by Waymo, and both are now Waymo employees. Uh, so this was also published in ICML 2020. So if you think about the top picture over there of this vehicle trying to negotiate a merge, and for you and me, that's a pretty typical thing, right? We, you're trying to get into the traffic and you're gonna nudge in and get in eventually like that, right? So, but for an autonomous system, it's really trying to, it looks at this as a very non-cooperative environment and it's trying to decide, you know, how should I be, remain safe or actually make a move and be assertive. And so it has to, but it has to do this without much hesitation, without too much delay. And so there is some kind of performance anxiety in that sense, right? But, uh, and then if it becomes too aggressive, then it could be the cause of a safety problem over there. And, and but now we don't want to just look at it. So we hear this, this kind of, you know, anxiety of, you know, performance anxiety is not very well captured. We cannot quantify that very easily for just regular driving scenarios. But when we bring it to racing, here you can see that we have, uh, um, I think it's Alonso and Vittel over here. They are racing at extremely high speeds over plus 200 kilometers per hour, very high, uh, very, coming very close to each other. And they don't know what move the other person is gonna make. They have some idea, but they just don't know that the strategies are secret over there. So given this high stakes, you know, how do they balance then, you know, they can't go between very high performance and very safe. They have to constantly balance that, right? So, so first thing is obviously crashing is extremely expensive and very dangerous in this kind of scenario, right? Uh, the second is that we don't have sensors that can kind of estimate and predict the intention of the other drivers. Uh, and the other drivers can have many different ways to move uh, from the current position to the next. And we need to kind of, uh, kind of uh, intercept them and basically be able to predict what they're gonna do next over there. And then the third is that, you know, we can't just mine previous race data and say, oh, this is a simple supervised learning problem because the race strategies, including like what they put in the vehicle is all secret. You don't know, there's not much history on how. So this is a really small data environment that we are regime that we are working in, right? So, so we start with basically a classic like reinforcement learning formulation where we want to minimize the expected cost of a set of actions over some time. And, but the, the problem here is that we are dealing with a lot of uncertainty and how other agents are going to behave. And so therefore we have, we convert this into a mini max problem where over this, this uncertainty set P, we basically have the state transition probabilities PSA. And we are trying to build now models that can capture, can parameterize, you know, what this uncertainty is in terms of a POM DP. And, and so if we did not have any uncertainty, then you know, we wouldn't need that inner max over there. And so essentially the overall idea is to learn, you know, useful parameterization of this set P. Like how do I really think about other drivers? Do I just think about them continuously as what's the next steering angle, what's the next throttle position or something more abstract and something more descriptive about their driving behavior or their driving policy over there. 
right? So the way we start doing this is first offline, we generate, we want to generate essentially a set of very competent agents who can then compete against the, 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 this opponent driver, but we don't know what the other driver is going to be like. We don't have you know, any idea that their, their racing strategy is secret. So, so we have to then use ourselves and use self-play essentially to learn this P and basically generate not only competent other drivers, but also a diverse set of other drivers. And then once we do this offline, when we are ready to race and we are in head to head with the other driver, then online, we basically have to use robust planning. And basically this is working within this belief space of knowing, uh, getting an expectation of what type of driver I'm racing against over a set of policies that I know about from my self play and try to figure out, oh, this driver is a mixture of these types of drivers that I have trained with before and try to minimize my uncertainty of what this other driver is going to be and then basically plan my maneuver against that. So let's take a look as we go through this setup over here. <clears throat> so so our, our goal basically is to generate this diverse set of competitive agents eventually, right? So offline, we basically want to generate this vehicle over here is generating basically a, a set of goals or positions where it would like to be given that it knows that there's competitors over here. And we basically want to train a net to capture a good set of and a varied set of trajectories over there. And then off those trajectories, we want to have a goal evaluator, which basically picks the trajectory with the minimum and robust you know, cost. So, so the way we do this offline is that we essentially have a search algorithm that uses like a, a MCMC approach, which is population-based. So I won't go into details of this, but essentially what this is doing is that it is generating set of using self play a set of agents and then letting them compete against each other and then uh, the dynamically and over time basically filtering out the most com competent agents um, and so then we take the best set of agents out of this uh, offline and so essentially we now have you know agents with different driving policies that are very competitive and, uh, and here you can see that just in isolated laps, they have, they don't just pick one racing line and just all stick to that. They have their own kind of racing lines that they want to pick through. And also when they are racing against other agents in the self play, they have a diverse set of maneuvers that they can go through. They're not always trying to go from the inner side or do like a simple kind of optimization over there, right? So, so then online, after we have, this diverse set of policies that we've generated offline, we then have essentially what we have is uh, <clears throat> each agent now maintains a belief vector WT of the opponent's behavior. And then, oh, and it's basically trying to figure out over these prototype behaviors that we captured offline, how does this agent fit among that, right? So it's kind of trying to sort of match this agent uh, within this belief space. and. So essentially it is, it is planning now, it is, it is thinking, okay, if this car is going to generate this trajectory, then off my possible trajectories, this is the best cost one over here, but we have to do this robustly. So let's take a look at how that would happen, right? So suppose, for example, I only generated just three, you know, opponent models. We generate many more than that, but just, so, so we have essentially this belief space between these three opponents and we want to figure out what kind of mix is this you know, particular opponent that we are racing against over here? Where does that lie within this belief space? So say if we pick opponent model one, and we believe that this uh, opponent is going to take this trajectory, and then I'm going to generate this minimum cost to overtake this vehicle. Now, or if I go to opponent two, I believe it's going to take this trajectory, and then I basically figure out what trajectory I need to take to overtake that opponent. And similarly, over here with opponent three, the thing is that this opponent is not going to neatly fit one of my offline selected opponents, and it's going to basically be a mix of that. And so I have to basically now optimize across 
all of these to figure out what is the max cost of generating a trajectory to overtake this. But we don't want to just generate that for a single dot over there. We want to also do that given that there is uncertainty about how this other agent is going to drive. So that's why we have to take the max over there. So, <clears throat> so essentially we then repeat this now as we start to race, initially we have a lot of uncertainty and then we start to identify how this driver is racing. And then, as, and then we have an online adaptation approach. And we have to do this at every step for each of the trajectories we generate and figure, out, figure that out in the belief space. And, but iteratively, as we go through the race, we start to improve. And so as we go through the race, initially we, have, we think this could be any one of these opponent types. And then gradually as we're racing, as the race progresses, we start to get a, a stronger belief as to which opponent type predominates among the set of prototype uh, driving policies. And so let's check first, our, our simple hypothesis was that with increased robustness, we should have increased safety, right? So with increased robustness over here, as we're getting to be more robust, we have, we can see that, you know, this time to collision, which is essentially a measure of how close we are coming to crash with another agent. We see that the time that we, the percentage of time we are in that dangerous region does go down. So we can see that the more robust we get, the better we, we become, the safer we become. So that hypothesis is good. But what we want to answer is the bigger hypothesis over here, question is that as we <clears throat> actively identify the opponent strategy, can we regain this balance of not just being too safe, but also becoming more competent, right? Because if we just become too safe, then we can see that as we, if we don't have an adaptive uh, agent, then our wind rate falls from 60% to 50% over there, right? So, so yeah, you're getting safer, but you're not gonna win and you're out of the race then. That's a career choice, right? Uh, it's not a choice really. So, so, so then we see that, of course, with online adaptation, we see that we can maintain this high wind rate as we go through this, because we are safe when we are very uncertain. And then as we basically build up our, uh, a, uh, a smaller ambiguity set uh, and have a better estimate of the other agent, we can basically improve on that, right? So, and then <clears throat> these are experiments that Billy had run right outside, you know, in Skirkanich and where we have this one agent that is racing against the other agent. And, it, and they are basically now learning online and figuring out how to do this race. So whatever kind of research we do, we also want to see that in action and we want to see how that works, right? So, so, so the, obviously the, there are big questions like, okay, you know, and this is for research questions of if you want to get involved is to see, well, how do we approach this problem, you know, considering, you know, out of distribution agents, what if they're not one of the prototype policies that we designed, right? And then how do we, you know, address the same problem, you know, without just building prototype op opponents, are there different techniques of doing that? So now I'll pass it on to Billy, who will talk about the next theme. Hi, everyone. Um, so next, I am going to look at the autonomous racing problem from a slightly different angle. Um, so the theme here is how do we um, build the most uh, efficient autonomous race car without spending um, too much human labor. So the research question here we're trying to answer is that um, how do we build the highest performing, the most efficient, and also maybe the safest autonomous system across both hardware and software um, without the usual human engineering where you have to tune the components separately. So we study this problem as a uh, multi-domain optimization across uh, vehicle design, controller design, and uh, motion planner design. So we call this a tuner car for obvious reasons. Um, so this is work done by Matt and me and uh, Achin and Rahul. And this was presented at April 2020. So the te technical challenge of this problem, um, it stems from the race that we host, the F110 race that we host every year. So we see that the teams participating when they're tuning their 
car, they spend a lot of time and it's uh, to, to, to fit to a new track. It's slow and inexact. Usually there are some rule of thumbs that you can follow, um, but most of the time you just change the parameters, put the car on the track and then see how it performs. So for example, you have, uh, if you see these sliders here, right? If you have the vehicle mass, you can change the wheelbase, you can change. Then you can also move around the center of gravity. Um, and then you can also change the path planner type um, that you're using and then figure out how it performs. So you slowly gain um, a faster and faster lap time while you're tuning this. And then eventually you come up with a good solution. So we want to um, create something that's reusable. So you don't have to do this process over and over again for different tracks. Um, and, and racing is a good, um, good, good environment for this because it provides a very clear measure of quality. So we just measure how good a race car is based on the lap time. And also having the wrong configuration is also very punishing. So there's a good objective um, for us to do the work. Right. If you imagine the environment change and your vehicle change. And then finally, we want to um, be able to adapt to basically all the different environments and different uh, vehicle hardware, and then it will still perform the same. So um, a slightly more formal <laughs> uh, problem statement here is basically we want to minimize the objective, which is the lap time created by our simulation. And then uh, the simulation will map a search space. In this case, it's about um, up to 500 different parameters that we use, and then it maps it from a high dimensional space to a real number. And the approach we, um, we use here is gradient free optimization because our search space is high dimensional. Um, our objective function is basically uh, obviously non convex and uh, non smooth. So we use um, this. Um, this type of optimization that's very close to um, what you might know as uh, evolution strategies. So what they do is that they'll sample candidate instances with different parameters um, using an underlying distribution that they believe that this distribution will give me either a very diverse population or a very good population. And then we update the sampling strategy based on evaluation of the candidates that we select. So once we have an initial um, population, we basically create different instances of these autonomous systems, right? You can have different, uh, so each candidate in uh, every, uh, every generation of the population will have different parameters. And then you can also create constraints on the hardware and software during this process. And then lastly, you send it all uh, in parallel to a simulated environment. So we run the full rollout of, um, for example, on the racetrack, and then you get a score, basically how well uh, the candidates that you sample did, and you report back to the gradient free op optimization, and it'll update the uh, underlying distribution that it's sampling from. And then lastly, we validate the best solution that we find on either the physical system or a high fidelity simulation. Um, and then we do, you can do a sensitivity and robust analysis on the found solution. So uh, here's some of the um, results that we see. Um, for example, we see in the brown line, so the brown line is our baseline. This is the simple random search. So your distribution is basically uniform and you're randomly choosing uh, points in the space and then you're evaluating it. You see it's um, basically higher than all our other methods. Um, and then in the purple line, you see one plus one, which is a greedy evolu uh, evolution algorithm. So we see it drops off very early in the beginning and it just fixates on one uh, solution that it found during the initial population. Um, and then in orange and green, you see the two um, variants of differential evolution. So they perform about the same. It gets a pretty, they fixate uh, at the end, I think on uh, three or four different uh, like different solutions but it, um, it's not the best performing one and then you also have in red particle swarm optimization this will give you a very diverse population at the end but it's still not the best um, in terms of lap time so what we see here is a cma yes so this is evolution strategy with a covariance matrix adaptation um, what it does is uh, balance 
basically the explore phase um, in the distribution and also exploits when it finds a good solution. So we see that it starts from uh, not lowering the objective by too much, but it maintains a very diverse population. And then after more and more evaluation, it eventually converges to one very good one. And um, we also did kind of try to figure out um, what kind of component in the system will uh, is most sensitive to noise. So what we did here, we basically added um, standard Gaussians of different um, variants. So as you see at around 10 um, to the negative two, um, the success rate of the, uh, the vehicle not crashing on a track has a steep drop off. And then you also see that the decision parameter that we chose in the subspace has the biggest impact and the overall performance basically follows the same trend. And then we also see some very interesting mode of operation. So for example, this is the uh, Spielberg track that we run in the simulation. And in the graphic on the left here, um, you see basically on the X and Y is the same uh, track position you see on the, on the right. And then, but on the Z axis, we added slip angle. Um, so this is basically signaling how much the car is going sideways. Um, and you can see in the, in the corners here, the slip angles are some, sometimes it goes up to 80 degrees. So it basically is going sideways instead of slowing down and not slipping. And then you can also see on the right here in the corner, um, we did a comparison with a more um, traditional approach where you figure out uh, what's the uh, what's the optimal velocity you should go at corners and you can see uh, in the in the corner here it doesn't follow what you think is a traditional race line but it slows down less so what i figured out is that instead of slowing down um goes uh and go steady around the corners i'm just going to keep the velocity and uh, drift through the corner so that was really interesting um and then you see we then performed the actual experiment uh, on the real hardware. So what I've done here is basically setting up a, a virtual track in the Levine lobby. And then you see very close performance in, in terms of the real hardware and the simulation that we see. Um, there is some variance because you know on hardware, it's never the same. And also you can see the surface type change uh, when it goes near the Levine door. And then next, we also did lab around the uh, Levine loop. Okay, so that's um, the overview of um, this theme of research. And in the future, we, we are planning on ex also expanding um, in this theme where we um, basically learn the same to real gap in terms of um, having a dynamic model that can adapt to different uh, environments and sensor change. Um, we also want to explore the performance tuning in a multi-agent setting instead of the single agent setting that we did. And next, I'm going to hand it over um, to Johannes to talk about our next team. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, you probably heard of that an autonomous vehicle is mostly consisting of three software parts you have perception you have planning and you have control but when it comes to autonomous racing or racing at the limits of handling you mainly focus on the path planner and the controller part what you see here in this small video is an excerpt from the indie autonomous challenge from the simulation environment and you see here 12 out of 16 teams just crashed so we could now say maybe it's because of a bad perception, but in this case, um, the vehicles had a very good perception, but their planning algorithms were very bad, which means overtaking in a multi-agent environment is quite difficult. And finally, of course, you have to control your vehicle on this planned path. So we said, or when we looked at this problem, we said we have a bunch of research questions. So first of all, how can we evaluate the path planners and controllers only? Which means we are focusing on these two con concepts or software parts only. Then what is a good performance metrics for a path planner? 
Is it maybe just the accuracy, what you know from the controls, like you have a path, you follow that, you're not deviating from this path too much, is that enough? Or is it the number of overtaking maneuvers because then we were successful? Or is it just not crashing? So maybe it's all of those three, but let's figure that out together. And finally, because we are just focusing on these two parts, we want to speed up. We want to speed up the evaluation and the simulation because we want to get more results and more insights here very quickly. So when we think about this problem and this research question, we have a bunch of technical challenges we have to solve. First of all, we need a simulation environment which provides us a good vehicle dynamics um, simulation. That means for us, a 3D environment with good object detection or sensor simulation, we don't care about that here. We want to have a good representation of the vehicle physics, which means accurate vehicle models and accurate parameters that model the physics. Then this environment needs to be fast and deterministic because we want to replay a lot of the results. We want to retest this again and see if we get the re same results. Then we want to use reliable tested path planners and controllers. So you probably heard of a star, you heard of an MPC, you maybe heard of a Dijkstra or an RRT. So we have a lot of path planners and controllers out there. But here's the question. What is a good combination? What is the best path planner and the best controller that achieves exactly the objective we want to solve here? Then we're going into the detail because now it's time to find a good search strategy. What are we searching for? The better algorithm parameters because we just tune them. Do we searching for a bad vehicle behavior or do we search for critical scenarios? That's a question. And then when we're thinking about the simulation environment, we need to go into death here and create an intra scenario test generation. So with these technical challenges and with these um, research questions, we set up a problem statement. We said the goal of this research is to find failing tests, which means we are searching for crashes. That means we're creating an environment, we're creating a simulation, we're creating a scenario where we let two cars drive against each other and we perturbate the adversarial agent's position and velocity. And each, each time step, we try to find as many crashes as possible. That means let's focus on one turn only. Let's say turn to the right, and we have two vehicles that want to overtake each other. We now move around the agents, the, the uh, other agents' position, and try to overtake him every time. And the more crashes we found or find, the better it is for us because we then figure out that our algorithm has a problem exactly in this turn. So now we have the idea we, how to tackle this problem. Let's set up a solution here. First of all, we create and use a deterministic autonomous driving environment. We call that the F1 Tens Gym. We will show that later. You see it here in blue. That's just a 2D environment where you can drive with two cars very quickly. This environment has the opportunity to choose from a wide variety of vehicle dynamics modeling, like bicycle model and an extended bicycle model, a two-track model where we have a lot of parameters we can integrate and have accurate vehicle physics movement. And then, because we want to drive as fast as possible, we of course have to race on a racetrack. What you can see here is the Austria racetrack. Billy just showed that before. That's one of our main racetracks we are using. And we create an environment where we have two vehicles that race against each other. And the idea is our ego vehicle has to overtake the other vehicle. And now comes the new part, or let's say the idea of finding the crashes. We are using an RRT-based approach to perturbate the agent's movements. And we are searching in the objective space to efficiently search for collision scenarios. Then. We move on when we get our results, we display them on a racetrack and search for clusters with a lot of crashes. You can see here on the right, when you look at the racetrack that we have specific areas, for example, turn number one, for example, the straight, completely the st number two straight, where you have a lot of dots, where it shows you that there happened a lot of crashes. And that gives us the opportunity to search in this area because something was clearly wrong here and our path plan and controller did something good on the other areas. 
Then we run all these experiments again and pull out all the path planners we created. We have currently five path planners, disparity extender, a Fernet planner, a graph planner, a lane switcher, and a gap follower. And all these path planners are capable of racing fast, but not reliable in what we see later. And then we evaluate the number of crashes and clusters. To give you a short example how this stress tester look like, we call it stress tester because of, uh, we focus here explicitly on the crashes. You see here on the right, the cars are moving in our simulation. The um, white car or the violet car is the ego car that's in front and that's trying to, no, it's in the back and it's trying to overtake. And we see here on the left side that we are exploring these areas and we're trying with the RRT to find the next agent perturbation and to find the next crash. And in the map here, you see what we explored so far and how far our car came with a good setup and where the crashes happened. So we run this for the whole track and afterwards we evaluate all these crashes. So that's um, uh, a test scenario and a testing environment we just created. We made a paper out of that and we'll submit it. And afterwards we thought about how can we move forward with this because that's just foundations for us now. But this idea has a lot of research opportunities. Number one, we explore a lot of more racetracks because I'm not sure, like, what do you think? Is the straight something that we have to explore more or is it the hairpin, for example, number one or a chicane in number three? We don't know. Like, where do we see a lot of crashes happening and where do we see vehicle behavior that we have to explore more? Then we want to gain more insights in the couple effects of control and path planner. I said before we have five path planners now, but we also have like four different controller types, PID controller, LQR controller, MPC controller. When we combine them, we see coupled effects. Let's explore them and see how we can tune them afterwards together. And that's number four. We want to combine this approach you see here, this stress test, this RT exploration with a tuner car approach you saw earlier and afterwards get a very good setup for the parameters of the path planner. That means finally, when we finish this work, we have an opportunity to run scenarios and tune the planner and controller parameter. And that gives us a lot of power and it gives us a lot of insights in the path planner only without focusing on perception. And Finally, we want to present then our fourth theme for today, which we call um, the AI-based co-designer for model-based design. And the big question is how to combine previous designs to auto-complete new designs with new requirements. So when you are a designer or an engineer later in a company and the company asks you, let's design a new drone, you're sitting down and then you start to think, how can I design this new drone? So you first of all talk to your colleagues and ask them, how did you do that before? And then you start to search in the database of the company. And then you have experience from the university. And then you remember, hey, there's a cool tool I can use. There's some CAD models I can use. And then there's like some specification documents someone set up because he said the drone needs to have like four wings. And then you use all this information and create the new drone. But we want to make that a little bit smarter because we think, first of all, that's a lot of work. And second of all, it is, takes a lot of time and we want to reduce that. So we set up the research question, how is it, is it possible to create an automation for this design? So we let the machine learning algorithm, the AI, just let them design the new drone and how it looks like. And is it possible to create, for example, um, partially synthesized designs like we don't want to have the complete drone but do we get like half of the drone or do we get an idea how the drone should look like do we get specifications out of these algorithms there's like many many research questions we can try to answer here and the technical challenge here is obviously that designing especially a cyber physical system is not so easy because first of all we have an objective is it like the mass? It doesn't need to wait so much. Is it like the size? Is it the performance? Is it safety? Or number one, is it just the cost? Because you just have a limited budget. You cannot say like this drone has cost a billion dollars. 
fine. No, you have a budget. And this budget restricts you in your design process. Then, because we have a cyber physical design, we have to take care of mechanical, electrical, and software. I mean, a lot of components, and that's creating a high dimensional design space, which is hard to figure out, especially for a computer. Then, as I said before, normally you as an engineer, you as a designer, you take care of that. So all the, the knowledge you have is very, very important for the design process. Fourthly, we have the constraints that are maybe unknown to the, um, to the um, computer. For example, think about a car. Let's say, computer, please design a car. And the computer creates a car with like four wheels. And you say, why? <laughs> a car needs to have like four wheels. But your computer doesn't know that. So you have to integrate all these constraints for the computer. So it's giving you a good design afterwards. And last but not least, we see that the current tools we have in this design process do not scale when it comes to more data, when it comes to more parts you have. So a lot of technical challenge we have to solve here. And we said we have an idea together with our team from MIT, from Siemens. It's like a big research project. And today I want to show you just the whole idea how we can tackle this problem and how we might solve these big research questions. So first of all, we have a lot of seed designs. We have design corporas, we have the engineer's knowledge, we have yeah, data from work, data from products that are in use. And you take, take all the data and distill the knowledge, like you create knowledge out of these products. However this knowledge looks like, we can just think of a big Excel table that it in, um, includes all the information about the products. But because we know an Excel table, that's very unfortunate, it's hard to read that or it takes time, we want to use a technology called knowledge graphs. In these knowledge graphs, we embed all the knowledge about the product. And afterwards, we have a design space constructor that is having the constraints integrated. We can use here later, of course, the human, because the human says, no, 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 no. There's information inside this knowledge graph. You don't want to have that. We, here's the constraint. Again, the car needs to have four wheels, not five wheels. And then you get finally a design space that has the constraints integrated. And therefore, we have solved the first part. We created a new design space we can search in. In the second part of this pipeline, we then trying to explore this design space. So exploring this design space means we need to search in the knowledge graph. This search is mainly done with machine learning algorithms and with optimization. And that's where the real magic happens and where the holy grail lies in because searching all this information and combining this information afterwards together is then creating for us in the third part in so-called design composition for us a new and detailed design. And again, here, this is just machine only. This only happens in your computer. This only happens with the help of algorithms. But in the end, you need two times the human. First of all, in, in a constraint space creation, and second of all, in a detailed design. Because when the computer is giving you a detailed design, for you, it's now the question to decide, is it a good design or not? Because the knowledge about how good a design is we don't have that yet, and that's something we do later onwards. That's the project idea, and that's how we want to tackle this problem. Now it's time for us to, to show you some of the results and to explain to you what we have done so far and why this might be a good design here. And I hand over to Billy. Um, so as Johanna said, we are starting from seat designs that we have before. So for example, we have the uh, H-copters, quadcopters, um, and hexacopters that we have. And then we basically approach this problem with um, two very different uh, approaches. So the first one is basically, you're keeping the topology from the seat design, for example, uh, you still have a quadcopter, um, but we have over thousands of components you can select, like different motors, um, different arms, different propellers, different batteries. So what you could do is, um, you're basically testing out, this is a, this then becomes like a, a combinatorial problem, basically. You test out different combinations of components and then you put it in the benchmark and you figure out, okay, which one is gonna perform the best. And the second approach um, is basically generating a new topology um, from the beginning. So you don't have the seat designs, 
So what we did is we basically represented um, the 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 drone design as a as a graph, right? You have connections, you have nodes, uh, and nodes are just basically different types of uh, types of component that you have. Um, and then we use two different uh, strategies in that. So the first one is you using a graph um, vari variational autoencoder. So you basically have a model that can generate different graphs um, from the from from data you've learned before. So how do you get this data that you learned before? So we basically have a graph generator, right? You can randomly generate a graph up to a certain depth. So you have rules on what nodes can connect and what edge can connect to a node. Um, so that's the two approaches that we took um, to the benchmarks. Um, so this was a hackathon that, that was held uh, last month, I think. Yeah. Um, so basically it, it consists of four different benchmarks. So it's all very simple. Um, the first one is basically you're supposed to fly a straight line. Um, and then the further you fly, the more scores you can get. Um, and then at the same time, you have to maintain some maximum lateral deviation. And the second one is fly in a circle. So um, you get points for complete completing the circle and also you get uh, points off for leaving the trajectory. And then you have a third one, which is basically a rise and hover, right? The, you're required to hover at some, at the uh, last 200 seconds of your rollout. And then you have to sustain at that high. And then the higher you go, the more points you get. The last one is the hardest one, which is a racing oval. So it kind of combines all the different, uh, different benchmarks. So this one is evaluated on time, right? You, uh, you finish the course in the, in, in the least time, the more points that you, uh, you're gonna get. So this is, these are the designs that we uh, submitted. So the first one is basically um, a hexacopter with a lot of batteries um, that we did the component selection from seat designs. Um, so you can see that the, the um, the optimization technique that we use figured out that, oh, it's a hexacopter. Um, it, it probably weighs more. So to compensate for that, it added two extra batteries. Um, and then for two and three, these are from the uh, quadcopter seat design. So for three, it figured out that um, you, can use, uh, you can use a symmetrical nature of the quadcopter and then uh, you don't have to do as much work on selecting components. And, but in two, if, uh, it figure out that one side of the propeller, since all the benchmarks are all flying counterclockwise. So it figure out that one of the propellers probably doesn't have to be that, um, that big and that you can save weight from that. And that's how it came up with this design. And then the last one and the most interesting one is that I'm surprised that this even fly, uh, this even flew in the simulation. So this is from the, um, generated topology that we had. So you can see it's a very weird shape and it scored uh, very, pretty decent uh, on the benchmarks. Um, and then lastly, the this is still a very early project. So there are a lot of parts that we saw in the um, proposal that Johannes presented that was not done yet. So there are um, still a lot of research opportunities here. So, for, um, so one of the projects that we were thinking is that from given documents that you have, so like all the constraints and designs you have before, how do you extract the um, the knowledge with the, where the designer had? So when you make a decision on using a different type of components, what are the what are the considerations that you made, and how can we automate that? And also, how do you basically have a more accurate validator, and then you can give feedback to the extractor to say, okay, this is might be. Uh, might be more important than other rules, and then you should focus on this. Uh, and then next, I'll give it back to Rahul to wrap this up. Thanks, Teddy. So, so wrapping it back to like you know, autonomous racing is in you know we are we are essentially building systems to operate at the limits of their performance of perception, planning, control. You got to make decisions in a very agile manner. You've got to balance safety and performance. You've got to optimize your vehicle design for that track, for that set of opponents. And you need to make sure that your planning and control algorithms you know, are stress tested out, right? And, and when you go to the next race or the next year, 
how do you come up with a new design, right? So that sort of combines all of these research themes that we've been looking at. So I'm just going to spend the last few minutes now talking about how you can get involved in this research if you want to, right? So, so we've uh, obviously, we, we, we love to actually also play with our toys, right? So we built over the past couple of years, this 110 scale autonomous racing car, but it's 10 times the fun because you can race it, you can crash it, and you can compete internationally with these cars, right? And they have full onboard, you know, NVIDIA Jetson NX, uh, a GP, GP, GPU uh, compute platform, a variety of sensors, and they go at a maximum speed of a, between 40 to 50 miles per hour, right? So that's very fast for this small scale. So in the past, we designed all of this, right? We designed, we got, we took a chassis, designed the power system, integrated all the sensors and built what we call like a perception planning control or a autonomous racing you know, software stack. All of that works on this platform. And now that's all done. You don't have to worry about that, right? We did all the dirty work, but it enables a lot of research over here. And, and but to complement the hardware, we also have, as Willie and Johannes have showed you, we also have a variety of simulators, right? That are the F110 gym that is based on the OpenAI gym uh, and uh, that can run you know, many concurrent uh, experiments and is very efficient. And then we also have the LG uh, SVL simulator that is a much more photorealistic simulator uh, that can race on actual tracks. And uh, uh, so, uh, so there are different variations of these based on what kind of work you want to do. And our goal over here is to help you know, everyone, you know, learn to build code and race, right? So, but, and, and so we want to take you from, you know, just going with simple algorithms of reactive driving to running slam, but for real, on real systems at really high speeds. And then going from, you know, simple kind of uh, control alg uh, planning algorithms to running RRT and, and several other al algorithms, but for real again. And, Going from simple PID control and you know just you know uh, pulling out your hair, tuning it to still pulling out your hair and doing model predictive control, and then actually racing it both in simulation and for real. But all of this is very easily done in our course that we'll offer in spring called uh, ESE six one five autonomous racing, and will be the same team that will be offering this course. The good news is that this course will teach you from the basics all the way. There'll obviously be learning and everything and vision in the latter part, but there are no exams. It's just races. You're just going to compete after, after six weeks, after 10 weeks, after 16 weeks, and you'll be in small teams to do that, right? So, so look out for that course uh, as it'll get announced soon. The nice part is that as part of the course and as part of a lot of independent studies, students get involved in a lot of very fun projects and uh, from across perception planning control and uh, we that has allowed us to actually grow you know both our systems but also expand the type of questions that we are asking over here we also organize international competitions in fact for the last uh, four days billy and johannes have just been running and organizing this international conference uh, competition at IROS. Uh, and there's a physical real race at IROS just the day before yesterday uh, with, with teams competing. And, uh, and so over the years since 2017, we've had many different races at different conferences. And the next one actually will be in May of 2022 in Philadelphia, because that's where ICRA will be. And we'll have our flagship race over there. And uh, so, so, so this is a great way to actually get involved. And, uh, and many companies are obviously interested. All of that good stuff is there. But the nice part is that there's a huge community. There are over 60 plus universities actively involved in F110. We distribute the cars to them. They build their own cars. They teach the courses. They do research projects based on that. And uh, so there's a big community in 2021. Billy, Johannes, and the team have been had been super busy. We had we built over twenty of these cars, even though COVID was on. Uh, we've become a premium member of the Autoware Foundation. You may have heard 
Shinpei Kato, who gave the GRASP uh, seminar talk on Wednesday. Uh, that's the open source autonomous uh, driving software that runs in most autonomous driving cars when companies are just starting out to get their system. So think of that as uh, basically the AV stack that you can put in any drive-by-wire car and get it to be driving autonomously in just a weekend. Uh, we got our F110 integrated in the uh, open source LG SVL simulator. We had over, I think about 32 uh, uh, GRASP uh, Robo Master students do independent study projects with us. That's almost like half the cohort. And uh, then we also organized a conference, uh, a workshop on opportunities and challenges in autonomous racing uh, at ICRA. And, uh, and then just, yes, just this past week, we had our last race. So for more details, you know, talk to us, uh, ask us questions, and also visit F110. It's not about this toy car, it's about what you can do with it. Thank you. Yeah, so three was just the, to show you in, in, in on, on a 2D plane, right? right. But, but essentially, uh, at, at every point, you are estimating, you know, what is a possible trajectory the other vehicle will take. Yeah. And then we are building on that estimate. And we are essentially, so in, in the beginning, we have a very large uh, ambiguity set. And then gradually, we are really looking at what combination of these preset policies that are there we are matching towards like that, right? But within that, we are also now selecting, we, we still have ambiguity. And so we are, that's why we are using the max for selecting among that. So obviously the, the challenge is that what if this ratio you saw was not, does not belong to one of the pre-recorded policies, right? Then, then the system will basically fall back to being uh, will have a very large ambiguity set and it will become very conservative and very safe. You may not win the race, but you won't crash with the other agent. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. I'll, I'll let Billy, Billy cover that. Yeah, so we just used a uniform size noise. That's a that's a good thing that we, we should explore that. So um, that was done during the COVID time, so we never had any access to hardware. So what I did was I just added the same noise um, to controller and um, the hardware part. But the but the um, the big takeaway there is basically not showing um, not showing that you're comparing these two on the same scale. It's showing that the found solution is very sensitive to any perturb perturbation in the um, in the in the solution that we found. So if you remember, it was drifting around corners. So you can imagine a very slight change in either the physical um, the physical dynamics of the car and the path planning algorithm. It should just crash the car, and that's what we see too. So that sensitivity plot is just meant to show that although we found a very good solution, it's just very easy to break. Yeah, um, that's a very simple uh, answer. The Spielberg track is quite short. You see everything in on, on one scale and you have all the necessary uh, turns, like a hairpin, a chicane, and two straights. So that's why we're juicing it. For example, when you see another racetrack like Sochi, it's very, very complicated. And we wanted to have just a simple track where we know what happens there to then justify the results afterwards. Yeah.
Uh, we didn't justify that. So even in the beginning, when the noise is, I think, close to like 10 to negative four, um, when you consider on the scale of the different parameters, it's still very small on what it would actually change. And you see that it's, instead of being 100% success, it's already dropped to 70%. So, so it's yeah. So maybe a more detail on that, um, the, the noise is normalized. So you have a max and a minimum um, range for each of the parameters. So the noise is added in the zero, uh, negative one to, or zero to one from the minimum to the max on all the parameters. So you, it, it does not guarantee that you're adding it on the same scale, but in some sense it's normalized. So, sorry, can you repeat the question? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's something we did with the with the tuner car approach. What Billy Billy showed here that we first of all use like we we search for a specific controller that we know its intrinsic algorithm its intrinsic setup is providing a good accuracy on racing right for example when you have um the so-called pure pursuit controller that's meant for high speeds when you have the mpc controller which is like optimizing based on the vehicle dynamics that's meant for high speeds right so we choose beforehand those controllers and know that its performance itself will be good but what it's all about is then tuning the parameters inside the controller because for a pure pursuit per, um, a setup we just have like two parameters to be tuned right we can then enhance it with pid parameters so we have like three or four parameters we have to tune we when you think about the mpc we have like 10 parameters we have to tune so it's more about tuning for this particular racetrack with a given set of controllers we know beforehand. So to give you another example, what you see before, it's like I showed five different path, path planners, right? And from their algorithm, like how they set up, they have a different performance just intrinsically. So it's just about not searching for the right path planner and controller for a specific racetrack. It's more about creating the right combination and then tuning it for the specific racetrack. Just and that's mostly our experience here. Yeah, but but I think I think your your you know your thought of you know switching between you know maybe it's a mode switch given that the context is different. Now we are at at a chicane versus a straight. Um, so so as Johannes mentioned, we could do that. We are basically kind of like almost like overfitting for this particular track, but then based on how the other agents are. We could explore. I think that's a really good idea to explore. Does this? Can we have a stable mode switching? And how does this? How do we trigger this mode switching under what conditions? And how much of an advantage do we get? Because drivers themselves are switching between modes. You know, they are defending, they are maintaining pole position, or they are, you know, in the beginning of the race, they are in a certain mode. So they have that strategy. So that's what a lot of our research is now going to the supervisory level of capturing this race strategy of you know how do you and also how do you look at it in terms of teams like that right if i have two racers on my team you have two racers on your team how do we work together within our teams to compete can we can we actually if we collaborate well does that how does that improve our chances of winning and so that's another supervisory level kind of uh, thing that we're looking at
Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So in theme one, the question was, are we just learning the transition probabilities or the policy? And essentially, we're learning driving policies, and, and that's what we are tuned, building up as competitive agents or competent agents, I would say. And here it's important that not only is the agent competent, but they're also diverse because we really, in some sense, in a very course, we are trying to pattern match what combination of these, but they capture the full policy. It's not just, you know, what is this steering angle and the kind of and the and the thrust that this driver is going to have in the next instance. But we are we are picking from this probabilistic behavior of the other agents. So, so in this case, yeah. So maybe it's better to uh, explain how exactly the policy is made in detail. So what it does is um, the car sees what sensor information that it has, and then it has to decide what the goal points are in front of it. And then after the goal points are selected, it generates a spline um, that you can follow. And then each spline, uh, the evaluator we say here, you have different basically weights for different cost functions for each of the agents. So also how the goal is selected, you can um, parameterize it uh, with the, we use the, sorry, we use a normalizing flow to basically sample uh, the space in front and then which are the uh, areas of, of interest to drop a goal point. So the agents are parameterized by the weights of the neural network and also the weights of the cost functions that, uh, that it's using. So it's not explicitly modeling this entire state action tra transition, it's ha basically handled by um, the MPC that we use to track those splines. So in the online phase, there are two components, basically. It's the, the first one is um, basically figuring out what the opponent is doing. Um, and so, so in that part, you uh, let's say you have 10 prototypes and you have a belief of a factor of 10, right? So you have for each prototype, you'll have, uh, let's say 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, that this is gonna be um, the, your belief on this is the opponent that I'm facing. So what you do when you're planning to select your goal is basically when you're evaluating these costs in the, um, in the MPC, you're considering um, it's kind of like interpolation, right? You, you, you're weighting the costs generated by these opponents by their belief, and then you're adding it all up to, um, to, to when you're selecting all these different candidate goals. So does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, so, so the, the belief, the the prototypes that you select online is not the entire population that you learn offline. It's We select, I think, in some experiments, 20 of the most diverse ones. So it's like a vector of 20, and then you're updating the belief um, every time you see it. Yeah, that, that's a very good question. So this is a big DARPA, it's like a 7 million DARPA project. And uh, so, and it's broken into the folks that actually, uh, we, we, we are building the essentially the pipeline, right, of the system. And then there are other teams that are looking at the uh, human aspect of the code design and we have to work with them, right? And, and so essentially, under the hood, like suppose we are we are looking at like the latent space. How do we represent that to the human to say, you know, I, I like to think of it as you know Jarvis for Iron Man, and Jarvis is going in the background and designing, you know, several instances, and then, of course, in the simple Iron Man analogy, he's just saying not this, not this, not take that one and make that better, right? So, so the human input uh, in the in the next slide actually is. Uh, it's really, you know, at, as, as Johannes mentioned, is at the initial part is in capturing the requirements and specifying like, you know, what they see designs are, what the constraints are. And, 
And then more in terms of looking at, you know, now that I have this constraint space, you know, how, and just fine tuning that because we don't want to just come up with this generative, stupid generative design that can come up with many illegal designs or designs that do not satisfy some constraints that are not captured in the system, right? There could be aesthetics, there could be certain aspects of the system design that we, we can't put in that knowledge graph. And then the, the, the next part where the human, the third part where the human is involved is when we come up with, you know, these partially completed or fully completed design instances, then the human is going to be selecting among those choices. So, it's, so you can think of the human as having different ways of interacting with the system. And that's what we have to figure out in this current, in this ongoing phase is how do we represent as an API for the human code designers now to interact with the system? Is it just a choice-based system? Is it retuning the weights? Is it basically uh, extending the models? You know, and, and so on. So I would say that it's it's the the points at which the humans interact are kind of uh, uh, known. I would say they're, they're not fixed. I don't want to use that strong word, but how the human interacts and what how that's represented, that's open. And different teams on that on that on the human interaction side come up with different representations. But we have to provide a, a interpretable enough API that they can then represent that in a rich manner. Thank you.